All right, so this is going to be a uh, lecture on AP review for Renaissance and Reformation uh, for the AP exam. Um, just some things. Make sure that you are uh, handwriting these notes while you take them. Also, uh, I'm going to try at different points to uh, make sure that I point out potential AP questions when I can. I think it would be really helpful if you take sort of jot down the question um, that I kind of bring up, pause the video, and come up with, I mean, you don't need to write full answers by any stretch of the imagination, but at least think about that. So that would be my recommendation to get the most out of this is when, when I do mention those types of things, um, to pause, maybe it'll jot down some notes on, on those questions, okay? All right, so let's get into this. Um, this whole PowerPoint is, is done by Sprite, so we're going to go Renaissance, social, political, religious, intellectual, all that kind of fun stuff, and then we're going to go through the Reformation and go social, political, religious, economic, technological, etc. Okay, so it's kind of how it's broke down. Um, let's get started. So when we talk about Renaissance society, uh, the biggest thing is, is what makes Italy unique is remember that the strong urban culture that had uh, continued as a result of the infrastructure that was really um, in existence from the Roman Empire. And so this, this urban community makes uh, early commercial development uh, possible. So this, this, this is somewhat, seems maybe somewhat small, but is a really important distinction in, in Italian society and what allows uh, this sort of commercial revolution that's going to take place in the Renaissance, or at least start in the Renaissance, to flourish in Italy and why it's more slowly um, going to spread to other European uh, countries. I, other th I also think that like this, like the, not only is it this urban living, but it's like this competition between different urban centers that is going to be really relevant to, so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Um, I think that it would be really an interesting question to uh, sort of compare and contrast like factors that caused differences in factors that caused like Renaissance to happen um, at sort of different paces or at different times in different parts of Europe. And obviously, so like with Italy, you're talking about geography, you're talking about differences in social structure, you're talking about differences in urbanism. Um, all these things are going to be relevant, okay? Um, one of the other sort of hallmarks of Renaissance society is like the development of this idea of the Renaissance man. And this really comes from Castiglione's book, the book of the courtier um, and it's like this whole idea of like a courtier is someone that is uh, in the court of someone powerful right and so like this whole idea is that um, to be like a true gentleman or like a true renaissance man that you had to kind of know all and be able to do all and that so Castiglione's book is something you really need to know uh, if we're talking about social structure here uh, 80 to 90 percent of the population are still going to be poor peasants, um, but at least in Italy they're going to be better off than everywhere else in Europe. Okay, so like this, 80 to 90 percent is going to be much better than, you know, the, the 95 plus percentages in other countries. Um, slavery is still part of Renaissance society, just not in the kind of way that we normally think of it as in sort of the race-based slavery that develops in the colonies in the United States. Um, the decline of serfdom you're going to see is a result of this commercialized or early commercial developments. Um, in Italy, remember, because of the urban society, serfdom was just a lesser part in other parts of Europe where agriculture was a bigger part of, of and like the serf uh, relationships are going to be a bigger part of that. Like we talked a lot about how those are differences. Um, and we'll talk about women later, but just kind of understand that society... Uh, you know, there's going to be at least the start of sort of questioning what to do with women as, as education spreads, um, as sort of the gender role for a man kind of clearly defines is like, well, what's, what's the role of a woman, right? So like as Castiglione is, is sort of developing what the, like the true sort of pinnacle man or who that is and what they can do, well, similar questions are going to be asked about women. Um, and then sort of the last thing I'll just say about socially speaking, remember when we were talking about early European history, when we talk about these changes, you have to understand that most of these changes are only really affecting rich people. Okay, so keep that in the back of your mind. 
this is where this is heavily skewed, like these changes are not really widespread throughout society. All right, politically, um, the Renaissance is going to start in the Italian city-states. Um, the sort of heart of this political uh, epicenter of the Renaissance, however you want to say that, would be Florence, and that's because of the Medicis and the Medicis' love of art and literature and architecture and just the money that they had. Remember, the Medicis are going to gain this wealth by being the bankers for the popes. Um, and really, they, the Medicis get rich by uh, basically financially supporting the, the Borgia Pope, uh, which is that guy that was the pirate. Um, you also, so Medicis and Florence, is, you need to know that um, the Doge in Venice, so the, the Venice is going to be the richest of the Italian city-states, and at least the wealth is going to be most widespread. Um, Venice had somewhat of an oligarchy where they had this sort of ruling body of, of like basically all the rich people in Venice and that every year they chose a new person to rule and that was the Doge. So um, it was sort of this oligarchical government that self-selected a, like a president per se out of that group. Um, and Venice is actually the uh, Italian city state that stays independent the longest. So I think actually Venice is conquered by Napoleon. Uh, in the 1800s, um, and, and from that point, or up until that point, they had been independent, so it kind of shows their ability, not only their wealth and ability to kind of hold uh, other powers off. Um, I think, I, well, I'll sort of skip over Salvinarola, and he's a fanatic that gains power when the Medicis get kicked out of uh, Florence uh, in the 1490s. Um, but I think the biggest thing politically is to understand is that war brings an end to the Renaissance, at least in Italy. Okay, And what causes the, the Renaissance really to spread more quickly outward is the invasion um, of uh, French and uh, Spanish troops into Italy. Uh, well, it actually starts in the 1490s and basically continues until the sack of Rome in 1527. That's kind of like the end of the Italian Renaissance. Okay, And most people say that's like the end of the like high renaissance. Um, so, I, you know, again, I don't know if you're going to get questions about like differences between high renaissance and later renaissance, if you're going to get questions about like Italian renaissance and northern renaissance. Um, but we can get to some of those differences here in a second. Um, so politics outside of Italy, uh, France and England are going to be fighting the Hundred Years' War. Um, what is going to end up happening is that this Hundred Years' War is going to cause important political changes in these countries. So the Hundred Years' War in France leads to um, a stronger French government, um, and he creates the first taxes. And remember, taxes are really important for these early kings because you use taxes to fund your own private army, and so when you have your own private army, you don't have to rely on the nobles for support, and that allows you greater power. Um, in England, um, the Hundred Years' War is going to lead to the War of the Roses, which the War of the Roses is going to lead to the Tudor dynasty, which the Tudor dynasty is like the Henrys and then Elizabeth I. Um, I think Henry VIII, that's what that H eighth is down on that bullet point, uh, he really is the one who sets up because we know we talk about Elizabeth and how Elizabeth is going to rule uh, the longest of any of these early English uh, monarchs. Um, but essentially, like the the outline for English uh, early monarchical power is going to be set up by uh, Henry VIII. So he's going to crush the power of the nobility. He uh, starts replacing nobles that were his biggest uh, competitors with um, lower class nobles, so they they relied on him for their power. Um, he's going to avoid wars. Uh, he's obviously super important because he is the one who breaks away uh, England from the Catholic Church with the Act of Supremacy in 1534, which we'll talk about that once we get to the Reformation. So Henry VIII, um, someone you really need to know. Uh, in Spain, uh, in the 1490s, Ferdinand and Isabella are going to consolidate power. They're going to... Uh, basically merged the Castile and Aragon, so like two empires. The thing to remember about like the Spanish Empire, though, and, and this kind of helps explain why Philip II was not as successful 
as other monarchs is that when they when they merged these empires, they kept two separate governments. So even though this like this merger between Ferdinand and Isabella creates like a Spanish empire per se, they're essentially going to continue to operate as two separate entities. Like they're going to have their own legislative bodies, they're going to have their own court systems. Um, and so like the wealth that, that Spain discovers in the New World is going to be really important. And, and then certainly like Charles V, how the, then you kind of have the blending of the Spanish Empire and the Habsburg dynasties and how like this is going to start the like the true Habsburg dynasty with, and you can see that little map there of, of like in yellow is all the lands that, that Charles V ruled over, which is essentially all of Europe except for France and England. Um, but like that's something important to keep in the back in the back of your mind about how like like the Spanish Empire was never really truly one thing. Um, don't forget about the Ottomans. I think a lot of people forget about the Ottomans and how like during this early time, the Ottoman Empire is going to be pushing for more control and how the Ottomans have a huge effect on European history. So the Ottomans are going to help spur like better technological and military developments in order to like Europeans want to push the Ottomans out. So that you could talk about this whole like military revolution. You could talk about this like uh, problems with Christianity and versus uh, the Islam. Um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things here. I mean, you can even talk about how the fact that like the Reformation is able to take shape uh, during this time period is because Charles is both in Eastern Europe fighting the Ottomans. He's also in Italy uh, fighting this war between France and uh, the Holy Roman Empire. So, you know, there's a lot sort of politically going on there. Um, religiously, so remember, the, rena the Renaissance changes towards secular humanism, or at least small parts of it, is going to really affect um, the way that popes live. And we've talked a lot about how, like, popes during this, this period are really not very religious at all. Um, you know, talking about they had wives and they had daughters and... Um, you know, I, I, I was just reading this stat that, like, at the Council of Trent, like, approximately, like, 25% of those uh, um, priests that were there, and, and obviously the Pope, there's, like, 25% of them that had wives, or at least had sex, uh, like, prostitutes at uh, Trent. So, like, we're talking about a Catholic church that is not very uh, pious, um, and a lot of that uh, impiety is caused by like changes in lifestyles from the Renaissance and Renaissance humanism. Uh, I think the other thing is like that that is the big effect of Renaissance humanism is that like the building of St. Peter's you can you could essentially tie to humanism anyway. So like the idea that like hey the life life on earth matters and like the that like you want art and you want architecture. Uh, I mean that's St. Peter's right? So they wanted to build a massive Catholic Church that connotated the power of the Catholic Church and wanted to be sort of this sort of uh, vocal point for them. And so um, then the money, like when they go around selling indulgences, which we've talked many times, like that that's Luther's, like Martin Luther's biggest um, like cause of, of this Reformation is like this, like uh, Tetzel going around Europe and selling indulgences and Many people criticize that, but that's the biggest thing that, that Luther, like kind of agitator of Luther. Um, but the reason they're they're selling indulgences is because they're trying to raise money to build. Something. All right, so back to this. Um, I'm trying to think where I was at. All right, uh, so I think we were talking about the need to raise money for indulgences uh, and how, like, that uh, is going to lead, like, the sale of indulgences is going to help essentially fund the building of St. Peter's, and, and the building of St. Peter's is essentially like an act of humanism by those popes to be concerned about architecture and art and all that fun stuff. Um, remember, though, that, like, the religious prestige of the popes had been kind of slipping for a while now. So, like, you have the Borgia Pope in the late 1800s that, like, basically everybody knew that he, not only did he have kids, but he was having sex with his daughter. Um, and so, like, that whole fiasco is going to lead to, like, the, the diminishing prestige of the pope. Um, and then you have Pope Leo, who is uh, Medici, who's, like, 
throwing these massive parties where there's there's orgies and there's 50 course meals and that's where they're like painting little slave kids in gold paint and they're dying and they're having to replace them and so like the the, the pope and the papacy as a whole and as an office like go through a pretty rough patch um basically from like the mid 1400s through the early 1500s um and that's kind of all building on like a probably a two or three hundred year period at the time where like you had the great schism um you also like during the renaissance they figure out that uh, the donation of Constantine that like essentially the Catholic Church had been lying for a long time about their uh, so like allegedly Constantine the Emperor had uh, donated land to the Catholic Church and that was the Catholic Church's claim to owning a bunch of this stuff and um, uh, humanists had basically figured out like hey that this was this is fake so um, just a lot of bad stuff. Uh, and people become very critical of the Catholic Church and the papacy as a whole. That's not even talking about like other problems in the church. And we'll talk more about this when we get the Reformation. It's like they're going to be upset with like the nepotism and simony, and like, there's going to be a whole bunch of things that they're going to reject. But I think a lot of these problems are both like problems that were church related uh, and historical, but like the calling out of these problems, I think. A lot of it has to do with the effects of, um, so, like, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, like, the Renaissance humanism causes the church to have more problems, but Renaissance humanism also causes people to become more aware of the problems of the church. So it's kind of this um, interesting thing. When you look at uh, lay investiture, all that means, so like the Concordat of Bologna, um, and lay investiture is an example of lay investiture, and all that means is that like a political authority uh, was in power over who was in what positions in, in the Catholic Church, not the Pope. So that's all that means. All right, if we look at intellectual changes, um, I think, like, obviously the biggest intellectual shift here is going to be humanism, and at the core of humanism is this sort of belief in individualism and the fact that, like, you as an individual matter and, like, individual lives matter uh, and that like man matters and all that kind of stuff is all going to kind of build from that. That that quote there where you see Pico, uh, that's Pico Mirandola. That's the guy that we talked about that uh, writes the oration on the dignity of man and basically like how special pe like man is. And um, I, I think that goes a long way in sort of influencing the thought of people like John Locke, for example. Um, so if we look at humanism. Uh, Petrarch is normally talked about as sort of like the father of humanism. Uh, I think the biggest thing that he does is he writes in vernacular. He studies Greek texts. So he goes back to the original, uh, writes his own uh, versions of it based on his interpretation. So I, I, again, not trusting sources and going right to the, uh, or not trusting secondary sources and going right to the primary source. Um, secularism is in very small amounts, but is a really important change. Okay, so all these people are, are mostly, uh, and I think I can almost say almost all of them, are going to still be deeply religious, um, but it's not totally religious. So that's, and that's an important change. So just even small amounts of secularism in the art and the culture, who they decided to study. And remember that secularism is going to have more an effect in Italy than it is uh, outside of Italy. So keep, like that's an important difference. So when you when you we, if you got a short answer question about um, like identify you know, similarities and differences between Northern Renaissance and Italian Renaissance uh, movements, like you'd want to talk about secularism, you'd want to talk about like the ways in which humanism expresses itself is is different. All right, um, I think you also see the spread of ideas with with. For, for really two reasons. I really should have two things there. Um, it's not just trade. I mean, obviously, trade is really important. So, like, our, the interconnectedness of the world, like, grows exponentially. So people are interacting more with different cultures, so it helps ideas spread. Um, well, and what helps that even more is, and, and I'll have that on the technology slide, but mention it here, is that, like, the spread of ideas is also greatly increased with the printing press. Okay, don't forget the printing press. That is 
more than anything, the reason that the Reformation takes off with Luther and not people before it is like the amount that printing presses spread um, from like the late 1500s, even till you know, we're talking about 1517, 1520s, um, like just in that short amount of time, that's a, there's a big change there. Um, with humanism, you're going to see that uh, universities are going to expand. This is one of those, remember, as we talk about like continuities between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, is like this growing university system, um, and they're studying. I think one of the biggest things that changes in the Renaissance is that we see a movement towards like the study of humanities and, and liberal arts and not just going to college to study the Bible. Uh, some important works that would be good examples to know. Obviously, we talked a lot about Machiavelli's The Prince. Uh, Vala's, Vala's the one that figured out the donation of Constantine was a fraud because he studied the language of the time and he looked at the language of that um, artifact and he said, well, there's no way that this, using the language that they used, that they could, like this is, that could have been written during that time period. Um, so like that's, you know, one, we talked about how that kind of was, was a bad look for the church, but also just like shows like the, the way in which like humanists approach studying texts. Um, Bruni is going to write a modern history of Florence. I think the biggest thing about Bruni is modern history of Florence. He's the first person that really tries to write a history book using primary sources, which I think is interesting. Uh, Boccaccio's Decameron is going to be about the plague in Florence. Um, I would definitely know Pico. We've talked a lot about Pico and how, like, like basically God created man, like as some some as something special, and as like like man is essentially created from God, um, and like I think that has an influence on the way that people think about what our potential is. So, like I think Pico has a really big influence on later intellectuals. As far as like, you know, like I brought up earlier, like I think Locke is probably the best example of that. Um, don't forget about Shakespeare. So like when you, if you again, if you were going to try to use some sort of uh, like compare contrast of like Italian Renaissance writers and Northern Renaissance writers, uh, Shakespeare might be a good comparison. Um, vernacular, uh, not overly religious. Uh, so, and then obviously we talked a lot about how, like, I would use, like, Luther as, like, a human, a northern humanist, too. So, like, Shakespeare would be a northern humanist who's more similar to Italian Renaissance writers, and, like, Luther would be someone that would be more different. Uh, we look at technology, um, Gutenberg's printing press, obviously, we talked about that. Uh, we talked about architecture, like, remember Brunelleschi's dome, so there it is. Uh, St. Peter's in Rome, so Bernini's going to build... Uh, you know, our design, St. Peter's. Um, and then um, Copernicus is going to first, and this is in the 1400s, so uh, late 1400s, early 1500s, is going to postulate that uh, maybe that the sun is the center of our solar system. So, and like I said, it upsets this whole idea of geocentrism and thousands of years of church teaching at that point. Um, if we look at Renaissance economics, uh, Italians get rich essentially being the middlemen of Europe, so they make huge sums of money importing goods from the Middle East. Um, and like again, this explains the wealth of the Ottomans. So the Ottomans were like the middlemen on the Asian side, the Italians end up being the middlemen on the European side, and they essentially get rich buying and selling uh, silk uh, and spices. Um, and so like this know, essentially this, the, the increase in trade is going to really help explain uh, the increase in culture and society at the same time. I mean, if people aren't making money, they're not going to be worried about, you know, what kind of clothes they're wearing and what kind of food they're eating. Um, and so I think to some extent, like, you need economic changes to kind of spur uh, societal changes. Um, don't forget the role of banking too. So like both the Medici's in Italy and then the Fugers in Germany are essentially bankrolling all these cultural changes. Um, all right, let's get into art here. So um, we talked a lot about art and I think like some of like the things that stick out is like the realism of the art, um, use of symbolism, 
the fact that people are going to be naked for the first time in a long time is important. Um, and just like the methods that they painted as far as uh, use oil paintings. Um, and so uh, I'll just kind of quickly go through some examples of this. So like if you see like the difference here of like Madonna and Chai in the 1200s and then you look at an example from Raphael, uh, you know, I still think like Jesus looks like an old man there, but at least like the human figures are uh, much more realistic as far as, um, and I mean, you got the depth of the picture in like a three dimensional space and how they tried to do this here in the 1200s, but it doesn't really come across that well. Um, you have a work here by Botticelli. Um, using lines to create depth and perspective uh, on both on the floor and then like in the window and all that stuff. Uh, we talked a lot about Michelangelo's paintings on the uh, ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Again, remember, don't forget, like God being encased in a brain here is really important. Okay. Um, School of Athens we talked a lot about like using lines and perspective. The arches even show Roman architecture. The fact that like this is a purely secular work of art is really important, especially because it's in Vatican. Um, two of Botticelli's other works here is the uh, Primavera. Um, again, if you just kind of look at the detail in, the, in uh, her hair, you look at these little flowers. Um, again, there's no religion to this, so this is like Roman mythology, at least no Christian religion to this. Um, you got the birth of Venus, this is the one I told you to remember. And again, remember, Botticelli's biggest supporter is the Medici's, okay? So, like, this is all being funded by Medici money. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. All this does is, is just show, like, the difference between, like, even how sculptures from the 1400s Renaissance, so this early picture of David was from 1400s by Raphael, this one in black, and then this second uh, statue of David uh, is by Michelangelo, and this was done in Florence in the 16, or 1500s, sorry. Um, so just even like in 100 years, the quality of sculptures and the realism in the pictures changes greatly. And we talked a lot about how like you see, you know, muscle tissue and, and veins and both in his arms and his legs and like that level of detail is crazy. Uh, this Bernini is, this is, so on the right is uh, the ecstasy of uh, St. Teresa. And this is where I was talking about, like, if you look at all these folds in, in the marble and how Bernini is a great example of Baroque art or late Renaissance art. And, like, I would definitely know, like, this sculpture. The one on the left, um, I forget what that is. That's supposed, it's some Roman mythology. Um, but I think it's always, this is always an example that I use as cool as, like, if you look at, and that's marble, that he was able to sculpt what that looked like, the indentation of a human hand on human flesh in marble, which to me is crazy that it, like it gives the perception that it's pushing in there. Um, some Northern Renaissance art, so Van Eyck is one that you could use. I think the thing that always freaks me out about this picture is that like he was able to, in the 14, early 1400s, is that he was able to draw this portrait, which even portraits were... Um, like unique to the Renaissance. Uh, you know, there people weren't drawing portraits of average people. Uh, the portraits were only done of popes before this or kings. But like this is just some average guy. And you can see the uh, his reflection in the mirror behind him, which is cool. All right, let's uh, kind of quickly mash through the Reformation here. Okay, so we talked a lot about like the origins of the Reformation because there's a ton of overlap with the Renaissance there. You have... Um, the, the Babylonian captivity and then the Great Schism where there's actually uh, three different popes at one time, which is crazy. Um, and then the, you have the whole Renaissance pope lifestyles that develop that aren't very pious. But I think what we don't talk a lot about is that essentially the Renaiss like or the Reformation builds up for, I don't know, anywhere of like 100 years, give or take, that like more and more people are going to start calling out the church um, more and more people are going to start translating Bibles into vernacular um, that like this uh, is going to be sort of long building, okay? And I'm not sure you would need to know a lot of examples of this, but I think a couple would be good, like John Wycliffe um, and the Lollards in England who are going to um, like talk about tr like having a personal relationship with God instead of just believing what a priest says, 
and then John Huss, which is going to do a lot of the same, but like in Germany. And remember, Huss is important, and we, I'm not sure how much we talked about him, but John Huss is important because he's, they, the Pope basically tricks him to come to Rome. The Pope says, hey, John Huss, we want to talk to you about these things that you're saying. And so John Huss comes to Rome, it's basically a trick, and they burn him alive. And so when Luther gets summoned to Rome, Luther basically says, screw that. Like, I know exactly what you did to Huss. Like, I want my trial in Germany. And so that Diet of Worms that happens, that Diet of Worms is, and Worms is a city in, in, in Germany. Um, I think it's important to realize that, like, Luther's like trial happens in Germany and Luther's trial doesn't happen in Rome, which is essentially what allows Luther to escape and then, like, basically do all what he does. Um, I think one of the things, again, maybe I'll just jump back to this. Again, I think you need to understand that, like, humanism has, like, this sort of dual effect on the Reformation. And so, like, humanism both causes popes to do things that are not very religious and, like, cause people to become more concerned with the church. But it also, like, enables the people that are being the critics of the church to be better equipped to and view the criticism of the church differently. So, like, humanism has this weird kind of relationship, both as a plus and a minus, um, with uh, the church. All right, so um, peasant revolt. So we talk about wars of religion here really quick and political stuff. Uh, remember the peasant revolt, because that's a really good example of how, like, Luther is an interesting case of, like, a religious leader being subordinate to politicians. So Luther believed that, like, God's realm was not of this realm, and so that, like, God didn't necessarily care who rulers were, and so therefore, like, Christians didn't have a right to reject their political rulers. And so, like, I think part of that we talked a lot about is that, like, Luther relied on the support of the German princes for his his life at that point because he had been excommunicated. Um, but I also think, like, there's, again there's some merit, like Luther tries to find merit for that in the Bible with like the whole give to Caesar, what Caesar's give to God, which is God. Um, if you look at the place of women, women are going to, the roles of women are going to change as Protestantism spreads. So one of the big, so Catholicism had sort of two uh, different effects on women. One, it allowed women to become nuns and study the Bible and be part of like this uh, like Christian Catholic lifestyle and be part of like what the church was so when protestant Re reformation happens and they eliminate monasteries it kind of remove women from having that but sort of paradoxically the catholic church is going to if not explicitly state this or subconsciously believe that like in practice that like women were the source of sin in the world and so um you know luther's going to change that like luther's going to allow his minister like his ministers or his priests to marry um, he's going to believe that women played important roles in the home and that like women should be like the models of what like true Christians were and like taking care of other people. Um, and so like that's important to recognize. Now, remember, you shouldn't just blindly say that because um, like John Calvin's Protestantism is going to have a very different view of women than Luther's Protestantism is. Okay, so always remember that. Um if we talk about uh, the effect of uh, the Reformation on the Holy Roman Empire, it essentially like leads to the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire because we talk about like the Thirty Years' War happens because the Counter Reformation is really successful, um, but the Holy Roman Empire is essentially split, and like the Habsburgs' inability to control all these German princes is split because of of religion, and so whether we want to argue that these German princes are really converting for religious reasons. I think you can argue that. Um, they're definitely being influenced, though, by the amount of wealth that came through. Because the Catholic Church, I think, at, and I used to know this, I think, I think at the start of the 1500s, they said that the Catholic Church was essentially owned like a third of all the land in Europe. And so like when these German princes would, would, would break away from the Catholic Church, I mean, many of them are doing this so that they can get the land from the church that they controlled in their area. Um, now, they may have been influenced by religion, but I think it's more likely that, like, hey, they saw opportunity to increase their wealth and power and took it. Um, we're going to see religious wars happen throughout this, not only between different Christian denominations, um, but also between the Ottoman Turks 
and um, the Catholics. And so like there's going to be this really weird sort of relationship happening between like we actually see the uh, Ottoman Turks and like the French are the first politiques. I think you could also say that like Elizabeth uh, helped the Ottomans uh, in their fight against Philip II because she wanted to weaken Philip's Spanish Empire. So like this, the creation of sex within Christianity is really important politically speaking on an international stage because you have like this sort of Christendom that had existed is shattered. And like, I think to some extent you talk about the creation of Europe instead of this like Christian empire. Um, we've talked a lot about the act of supremacy. Um, that's Henry VIII. You know, like I said, he, he doubles his wealth in land that he owns overnight. Um, it's definitely a political move, remember, because the Anglican Church doesn't really change things uh, religiously. Um, I don't know what else we got to say out of that. I'm going to jump ahead. All right, so Elizabeth I. Um, so what do we want to say about Elizabeth? So she's going to, I mean, religiously speaking, in her, her role in sort of this Reformation time period is going to be to grow the power of the English state and English monarch. Um, but then religiously, it's like she's also really important because uh, she essentially develops this like middle of the road Anglicanism where um, you basically try not to make Catholics mad and you try not to make Protestants mad and like basically make sure everybody's happy and not fight over religion. I'm doing that. All right, never mind. All right, here we go. Um, okay, so I left off Elizabeth. Um, all right, so don't forget politique, okay? So re remember that like the key word to associate Elizabeth with with politique, because remember, there's really two ways, and I just talked about her helping the Ottomans uh, when the Ottomans are fighting a war against Philip II, but she also remembers, uh, hires uh, pirates, or like at least works in, con so the, the, the British Royal Navy works in conjunction with pirates to basically rob Spanish ships of their gold. So like she kind of finds unique ways, um, and, and I think like that's a really good example, remember, of like Machiavelli's like be a, a lion and a fox like be strong when you can be strong and be cunning when you have to um, if you look at uh, Philip II's war so remember Charles is going to divide his uh, empire between Philip and his brother and so Philip is uh, the one that gets the Spanish Empire and his brother Ferdinand gets like the uh, Holy Roman Empire Austrian German lands um, Philip's going to take the mission on himself basically to try to like re-Catholicize the world so he's not only going to fight wars against all of like the uh, Protestant parts of Europe, but he's also going to fight wars with uh, the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean. Um, he's actually really important with that regard because in the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, essentially like with that defeat, the Ottomans are, uh, it's not like the height of the Ottoman push into Eastern Europe, but it, it essentially is like the... Um, like if, if the Ottomans had won the Battle of Lepanto, they would have been much more able to conquer Eastern Europe and possibly made, the, made their way into like Central Europe. Um, during Philip's reign, he's going to lose the Netherlands. Um, so the Dutch are going to split off. Um, he is going to hold on to like the Spanish Netherlands, which is essentially like Belgium. So remember it's like the, the Dutch break off and that's essentially what's going to help start the Dutch Golden Age. Uh, in the 1600s, um, but uh, Philip is going to remain, hold on to the Bel uh, Belgian uh, Empire, the Spanish Netherlands, and that the Spanish hold on to that until 1830. Um, Philip is going to lose to uh, Elizabeth, um, and again, that's another example that I didn't just talk about, that Elizabeth was actually helping the Dutch and their independence against, and their independence against uh, the English and so that's one thing to note again just like examples of her being a politique that actually would be a good question is uh, as an LEQ you can't so remember like the DBQ cut off the DBQ is from it has to be somewhere in between 1600 and um, I think 1980 and so like you won't get a DBQ topic about Elizabeth but I think that would be a good LEQ because you're going to get an LEQ topic one from early European history one from the middle of European history and one from like the most recent 
European history. And like a good LEQ topic would be um, like Elizabeth in English history. Uh, just because you can talk about so much politics, religion, uh, international stuff. So it's, it, it would be good. Um, all right, so let's talk about French wars of religion. Uh, like the biggest thing here is just like the fight between uh, French Catholics and French Huguenots, and especially because a lot of nobles uh, s switched to being Huguenots or Calvinists during uh, the 1500s. And so you actually have this War of the Three Henrys that breaks out, and this War of the Three Henrys is essentially like a civil war uh, between like different uh, political factions and religious groups. Uh, remember that the Calvinist Henry wins, but like it's Henry of Navarre. But remember, he converts to Catholicism because he has that like famous quote that says, Paris is worth the mass. So he switches from being a Calvinist to a Catholic in order to control Paris so that he can become the French king. Henry is also really a good example because Henry, once he becomes king, he passed the Edict of uh, Nantes, or I've been always jokingly saying the Edict of Nantes, and that's a really good example of religious toleration because he allowed the uh, Huguenots to have some limited religious freedom. Um, if we look at religious stuff, obviously we talked about Tetzel and the sale of indulgences being uh, like the biggest thing that's going to lead to Luther posting his 95 theses in 1517. Um, Luther, though, like many people were criticizing the sale of indulgences during that time. Luther's going to be different because he goes way beyond that. So not only does he say indulgences are wrong, but he basically um, says a bunch of practices the Catholic Church are wrong, the Pope is wrong, and like that just because a guy is Pope doesn't mean he's always right. And so like he says the Catholic Church is wrong about how people earn salvation and that you don't need to, you know, you can't essentially earn your way into heaven through what you do in life. You have to earn your way into heaven by true faith. Um, he's going to argue that the Bible is the sole authority and everybody should read it and that therefore like you should have your own personal relationship with God and that like um, anything that's not in the Bible we shouldn't do. Uh, and that's like, so that influences his um, belief in um, bap like uh, baptism and communion only being the two like valid sacraments because they're only two that are in the, in the Bible. Um, but even like Luther is going to argue like that communion, um, that like the whole like, you know, a Catholic priest getting up and ringing a bell like Jesus doesn't suddenly just appear in the, the bread and the wine. Like um, Luther is going to actually argue that the Holy Spirit is in all things at all times. And so that. Like, you don't need to ring a bell for the Holy Spirit to be in that wine or bread. It's, like, already there. Uh, so, like, there's some differences, not only in religious practice, but religious belief. Um, he's also going to have different beliefs about, like, the infallibility of the Pope. So he says, like, hey, the Pope is just a dude, um, and humans are prone to error. Uh, and so for that, he gets excommunicated by Pope Leo X. Uh, remember, Pope Leo X is a Medici. Um, Luther's going to get summoned to his trial, which that's all, when you see the Diet of Worms, you're literally saying trial at Worms. And so Luther gets a fair trial, largely in part because of Huss's burning. And Luther's whole like little clever trick that he pulls on the Catholic Church is he lays out um, a Bible, and he says, like, look, if you guys can prove to me using this Bible that I'm wrong, like, I will recant all the things that I said, but until I can be proven that I'm wrong by the Bible, like, I will refuse to change my beliefs. Um, and so, like, that's a pretty powerful, like, argument trick there. Uh, and because of that, he gets, like, the Edict of Worms, like, so the decision at Worms is that, like, Luther's a heretic, He's outlawed by the Holy Roman Empire. He's his works are to be burned. Luther is going to be killed, but he gets or executed. Um, but he gets sort of fake kidnapped by Frederick the Wise, and Frederick the Wise brings Luther back to Wittenberg and hides him in his castle. So I put kidnapped in quotation marks because he's like fake kidnapped by friendly people, so that want to hide him. And so like everyone thinks, oh, he got kidnapped. Someone surely killed him. But like his friends actually kidnapped him or made it look like he got kidnapped and they're hiding him. And this is important because in Wittenberg is that's where Luther translates the Bible into German and like Luther's work starts spreading much more after that.
Um, some of the things that we get up to, uh, so the what's going to happen is we sort of work our way towards the Peace of Augsburg um, is we have differences and the Catholic Church initially is going to refuse to like negotiate on this. You're going to have splitting between Protestant sects. So like Zwingli is going to split and then Calvin's going to split in the 1530s. Um, you also have the English Reformation happen. Uh, and we talked about how that's not really a religious reformation because it's mostly political based. And then once we get to the 1540s, uh, you have uh, the Counter-Reformation begins with when Loyola uh, creates the Jesuits. And the Jesuits start creating missions and schools and um, they start sending out uh, missionaries to convert people and to educate people. They also, importantly, start the Inquisitions during the 1540s. So you have the Spanish and Italian Inquisitions where they're basically going around and hunting heretics and killing them. Um, the Inquisition also publishes the Index of Prohibited Books. And so this Index of Prohibited Books is going to last, I think, 300 years. Uh, and it's basically a continual list of like works that were banned by the Catholic Church. Um, and so like obviously all Luther's books are going to get put on prohibited books. Um, interestingly enough, Galileo's work is going to get put on this list of prohibited books, and that's why he gets put on house arrest. Uh, so, you know, we'll talk about that more as that, that comes an issue. Um, so in 1545, the Council of Trent starts in the space of this 20-year period where the Catholic Church tries to make decisions about what to do about the Reformation. And remember, that's essentially like the reaffirm, not reform. So reaffirm, not reform. And they do make some small changes. So they try to better educate priests. Um, they tried to reduce the sale of indulgences. Like, of, like it's not that they completely like change anything. They just try to make small changes to be uh, less antagonizing of criticism. Uh, and then 1555 is really important that you remember 1555 and the Peace of Augsburg. That's the whole, like, the religion of the prince is your religion. So it, it allowed uh, religious leaders uh, in Germany to pick which religion they wanted to be. Now, they, they could only pick between Lutheranism or Catholicism, though. So Calvinism wasn't included in that. And that's a really important thing because uh, Calvinists are the ones that are essentially going to start the Thirty Years' War, um, not Lutherans. All right. Um, if we look at some of these intellectual effects of uh, the Reformation, so individualism is going to create uh, increase. So, I mean, and this is a, one of those sort of hidden parts of, of the Reformation, too, is that when we talk about humanism being an individual thing and, like, thinking that your life is important and not just, like, some preparation for death and your uh, afterlife, um, if you as an individual matter, then, like, you as an individual should also have a relationship with God. And so, like, I think this, like, as individualism increases, it also helps cause the Reformation, which also helps increase individualism, um, which I think is really important uh, as far as like the development of modern society goes, uh, as far as intellectualism goes. But I think that you should be able to make differences between like Luther and Erasmus. Um, so like Erasmus is a good example of like a reformer who wanted to reform within the church, whereas Luther said the church was too far gone and they had to like break totally. Uh, we're going to see huge increases in literacy because Protestants wanted everyone to read the Bible. Okay, so that's a big thing. So, and this has a really important effect on European history as a whole because essentially, like the Protestant countries become the most powerful and most um, like economically rich, largely because their people are smarter because they learn to be literate because they want to read the Bible. Um. I do think you could argue that the Reformation causes increased fanaticism. I mean, we talk about like the whole reaction of, of Catholics and Protestants to Anabaptists. I also think don't don't forget uh, during this time that like many people believe that like the salvation of your soul was influenced by the salvation of souls that were close to you. So like if there were like if you were a Catholic and there were Protestants living around you, is that like people learn to be more fanatic towards like people that were different because they believe that it affected the uh, their salvation. So I think there's something to be said about 
I mean, even like when the, uh, the Protestant Reformation first starts, uh, like Protestants go around like smashing churches and like they destroy works of art and statues and like many stained glass windows were destroyed because they thought that because the Bible actually pre preaches against like opulence, that like churches should be these very plain and ordinary things. So they like, they ruined a lot of old Catholic churches. And, and so like, that's a good example of fanaticism too. Um, with Baroque art, uh, this is part of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. I also talked about this in class today, is it being part of absolutism. Uh, remember, so it's like the art to encourage piety but it's also the art to encourage uh, like subordination to control. So like it's meant to connotate power and prestige and money and wealth and all those things. So if you think about, if you ever get a chance to go to St. Peter's uh, in Rome, like the moment you walk in that church and really like the moment as you're walking up to the church and you step into St. Peter's Square and you have these massive columns and this like sort of overwhelming thing like that, all of that was purposely designed to have an effect on people, um, to understand the power of the Catholic Church and the role that the Catholic Church had in people's lives, and supposed to show you that man's place in the universe is below God's, that like the Catholic Church is this sort of um, powerful uh, connecting piece between pe like Catholics and their God. Um, last slide here. I'll talk about the Thirty Years' War later on, so I'm not going to belabor this. Um, and again, last year the DBQ was about this, so Merry Christmas. It was horrible.